Hi, I'm Joel McDermott with the American Vision, here to bring you the continuation of our special interviews with common lawyer Brent Allen Winters. If you haven't heard our first interview on his book, The Excellence of the Common Law, I recommend you go check it out. This uh, second interview in the series is based on his little booklet called, uh, with this, with the surprising title for some of you, I'm sure, Don't Talk to the Police. Now, this is not an anti-police book. This is a book about what is the biblical doctrine of police. But more importantly, what is the biblical doctrine and the history in the United States of America of the right to remain silent? And how is that derived from Scripture? I think you will find this interview informative in a way that, uh, that you probably have never heard before uh, of the Scriptures and American history, and especially with the pulpits in the condition that they're in today. You will never, ever hear a sermon uh, like this, but you should. And books like this and interviews like this tell us why these are basic, fundamental, biblical doctrines and why they have a basis in the foundation of the United States of America and our common law tradition that was enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and much more. So, without further ado, enjoy this interview with Mr. Brent Allen Winters, and I'll be back with a few words uh, when it's over. All right, we're back again. This is Joel with the American Vision. I'm here with Brent Allen Winters. We're talking about the excellence of the common law, his book, and several of his smaller books here that he's written on more particular topics. And this is one of my favorites, not because I'm anti-police, a lot of people accuse me of that, but uh, this title, Don't Talk to the Police, is really about one of our most fundamental rights, almost completely forgotten. Oh, and God has given us governance over our tongues. Yeah. And there's two parts to that. There is the right to talk, which is responsibility. The old Germanic word right means fundamentally duty, responsibility. There's a right to talk and there's a right to not talk, to yes. remain silent. And our Constitution guarant doesn't grant those, guarantees both of those to us that the government will protect those. Mm -hmm. And that's good Bible, as we say at home. Mm -hmm. That's good Bible because the Bible says, be quick to hear the Apostle James, slow to speak. And throughout the Bible, we see that listening is more important than talking. The most often a repeated creed yet today throughout the world, Deuteronomy chapter 6, hear, O Israel. Hear, yeah, not talk, O not Israel. Not talk, O Israel. <laughs> yeah. Talking is important because if you don't, that's right too. There is a right to speech, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it is more, you're better off to be slow to speak, quick to hear. And that requires, of course, that you not, you talk when you believe in your own discernment, mm -hmm. that God wants you to talk and you don't talk when you believe in your own discernment that the other fellow who wants you to talk doesn't have a right to the information, doesn't have a responsibility, is not entitled to the information that your conscience contains. Absolutely, and that's, that's a very important thing. I want to read a, a very famous quotation from Justice Jackson here, which is in your book, and I've seen it quoted many times, but it says, any lawyer worth his salt, and this is, this is difficult for conservatives to hear, and not, we're conservatives, I would say generally, uh, but this is difficult for most conservatives to hear because we are pro-police in general. We're trained to think that way. Thin blue line. Law and know, order. Law and order, yeah. all those things. Those are actually fairly recent in our history. Now, they're not part of what the, the Constitution and Bible are about. But Justice Jackson says famously, Any lawyer <laughs> worth his salt will tell the suspect in no uncertain terms to make no statement to the police under any circumstances. Was he trying to be vague here or, or no. beat around the bush? <laughs> no, and he said that as a man who had served a long time as a prosecutor. Mm. He truly understand. I think Justice Jackson was the last justice to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States that had never been to law school. And he was the one that said the problem with lawyers and judges today, that was back in the 30s and 40s, right. the problem with them is they don't have the whiff, none of them has a whiff of the stables on them. In other words, <laughs> um, they haven't got this common good sense. He also was uh, a key player in Nuremberg ah. as a prosecutor, but he makes it clear, and this through experience from the prosecutor's side, Justice Jackson, that you're foolish to talk to the police. Hmm. Now, there are times you might be advised to say something to them, but certainly 
If there's any opportunity that you think the police might have to drag you into the soup of a mm. crime, and that, by the way, is more often than people realize. Well, that's another point of the discussion because a lot of people will say, well, I haven't done anything wrong. What have I done? Well, I've got nothing to hide. So why can't I just talk to my friendly neighborhood policeman uh, just to help out or say whatever I can, you know, to try to help things? And but even that's dangerous. Oh, not a little bit. Yeah. I would say, and this is my studied opinion, that, but, and I can't be precise, but between 60 and 80 percent, I've known hundreds of prisoners, mm -hmm. between 60 and 80 percent are there because they said something, because they wrote something on a piece of paper that was used against them. Mm -hmm. Even if you, all experience shows in courts, most people haven't been to criminal trial. And I'm glad for that. And yeah. I don't want that to happen to anybody. But for those folk that have seen this and have been prosecuted or defended people or both in the criminal courts, the courts that have tried criminal cases, you find out real quick mm. that the person who talks to the police and says, well, obviously, I'm, I have nothing to hide. I'm not guilty of anything. And all I can do is say I'm not guilty and I'll show how I'm not guilty. All that will be used against you. And against you. Against never you. Never for you. And if you say <laughs> never for you, that's not their job is <laughs> to find people doing, doing good things. Yeah. Their job is to find people doing bad things. Yeah. And so they're looking. That's what they do. Uh, oh, you're guilty. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the heartache that comes because people talked. I'm dealing with a case. Not I'm not involved in it as a lawyer, but in a personal way, uh, friends at another state where um, it was a wrongful death situation. And uh, the people that are now indicted uh, just answered all questions that the uh, police officers put to them, thinking they were helping, mm -hmm. helping the police officers do their job. But the police officers will do their job against you mm -hmm. if they can. And the prosecutors and the judges are moved that way. The reason the judges are moved to help in that situation and not even always to uphold the law that defends your right not to talk is because, as Justice Roberts said in his 2006 annual report, Chief Justice Roberts of the yeah. U.S. Supreme Court, that we've changed where we get our judges in America. During the Eisenhower administration, he said, 40% uh, of judges came from the government employment. 60% came from the private practicing bar. And now he said, and this was in 2006, that has been reversed and maybe even more than reversed, whereas most judges on the bench have spent their lives in government employment. It wow. is the way God has wired us. As Billy Budd said when he was had the rope around his neck uh, tied to the yard arm. He said, I have eaten the king's bread, therefore I am loyal to the king. Mm. Well, I, <laughs> God has been loyal to me and I'm loyal to him. That's what I try and I pursue. But it is true in all other ways. My father took care of me and still it would look out for me. And I'm loyal to him. Doesn't mean I have the trust that I have in God, but I'm loyal. Mm. Well, if you work for the government, Justice Scalia said, take a, a man that's had his nose, he puts it just this way, his nose in the government trough. Mm -hmm. He's going to think the government is right. Of course. And Who Justice signs your Robert, paycheck makes a lot of difference. Yes, that's any of us would be that way to varying degrees. That's why we say it's not right that judges be in that position. But back to the point um, that more precisely, the right to control your tongue is yours and nobody can take it from you. Well, they may kill you. Oh, I know. They may jail you. Yeah, for contempt. That can happen. The judge says, answer this question or I'll throw you in jail for contempt. Hmm. Susan McDougall, case in point. Hmm. Ken Starr wanted her to answer the question. She knew that if she said anything, it would drag her into a criminal prosecution. It makes no difference whether she's innocent or, or whether she's guilty. Our law says, Jesus Christ invoked this himself. And the Bible says, be quick to hear, slow to speak. And a wise man, the Solomon says, closes his lips. A foolish man opens wide his mouth. Mm -hmm. All you're going to do is create problems for yourself. If you, you talk a little, even when you're on the witness stand, let your, Jesus Christ put it this way, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't elaborate. I tell people on the witness stand, answer the question, don't go beyond it. It's either yes, no, or I don't know. 
That's it. <laughs> so we, we read uh, Justice Jackson's quotation about never talking to another police under any circumstances. And uh, so we get some basic guidelines from that. It's certainly biblical. But what I want to talk about here for a minute is how, what, how have we gotten to this place? Because it was a while back I read a, a manual. I've done a lot of research on police and history of police. And I, I found this manual online. It was called a handbook for sheriffs. Uh, something of that nature, and it was written in the 1920s. Oh. And in the 1920s, a police officer could not even arrest somebody unless he had a warrant from the court, or unless he witnessed a felony taking place right in front of him. So you couldn't you couldn't call the cops and they show up and arrest the guy on somebody said, well, he did this. Or yes. That. He had to have a warrant from. The, so how do we get this far down the road? And I guess the question I'm leading into is, why is it the case? that uh, if you say something to the police, they can use it against you in a court of law. But if you say, well, the officer told me this on the site, that's hearsay, and that won't be admissible as the evidence. Why does it work for him and not for you? Is there a system of law type issue here? That's my conclusion that there is because, <laughs> yeah, I can't make sense of it. People say, why does government do this? Why does government do that? Why do judges do this? It's because of a, of a, a leaning toward believing the government. And the reason that is given is because the government's not out to get any particular person. They're just going through their procedures. The normal course of their procedures is admissible, and uh, the evidence that arises from it is admissible. As a matter of fact, it's gotten to the point now, Joel, that the law in America is if the government breaks into your home without a warrant, and they find evidence of a crime or something they say of it is evidence of a crime, and you challenge that in court, the judge is going to uphold what they did. He's going to find some way to do it. And this is what blows me away. That's the law. Because if That's you bring matter. up this issue, people think, conservatives especially, this is anti-police stuff, that's leftist, that's whatever, even communist. But the truth is, it was this issue that was central to the American Revolution. We talked about this before the interview. John Adams... Um, John Otis, John Otis Jr., or James Otis, James Jr., uh, Otis Jr., yeah. and the writs of assistance case. And yeah. when he argued that case, it was this issue: search and seizure. Yes. And and John Adams said he was a young man in that courtroom in 1761. Okay. And he said, on this day, American independence was born. The the baby was conceived, or some yeah. such a thing like that. No, and because James Otis went into court, and what he said was, well, here's what happened. To back up a little bit. England and the legal beagles in England and the parliamentarians in England said the common law does not imply uh, not does not apply in our American plantations. Exactly. William Blackstone says that in the first volume of his commentaries on the laws of England. Yeah. And William Blackstone was a good so man. It was, so wait, we're we're common law colonies though, right? Yeah. So why doesn't common law apply here? What 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 were they doing in place of that? Admiralty law. So so yeah, so basically we were under a civil law system in yes. their minds, yes. and they thought they could come over here and act like a top-down bureaucrat. Well, if there's no common law, there's no right to keep and bear arms, there's no, exactly. there's no uh, bar against unlawful searches and seizures, and that's what they were doing. There is no right to trial by jury. The idea was, and by the way, that's why slavery was allowed in America, because they said the common law doesn't apply there, and people were foolish enough to go along with it. I'm and a so, guy that wrote a book about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very important, very important concept to understand yeah. Uh, the difference, again, between the common law and the law of the city. The king of England, King George III, was a pretty nice fellow otherwise. I think he had something like eight or ten children. Mm. And he loved gardening. And he promoted agriculture in his own country and anywhere else where he had any influence. But he said, and it was said of him, he's king in England, uh, common law king in England. He's emperor mm. in America. Yeah. Well, that's the law of the city, empire, imperial, command, will of the government. So, the, and of course, the Quebec Act, which you brought up at the beginning, was part of that plan as our Declaration of 76 to, to insert a law foreign to us, which was the law of the city. In that case, it was the law, the canon law of the Church of Rome, the Code of Justinian, which were essentially the same thing, and extend that territory down to the Ohio River. It's no accident that the Northwest Ordinance for 1787, of 1787, for the governance of the territories north and west of the Ohio River, which is Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, makes a point of saying 
that the trial by jury will be always there. I don't remember the exact words in the you know, beginning of it. Backing up now to John Otis again, where we, we got sidetracked there. A little bit. A great sidetrack. Yeah, yeah. Like, so <laughs> John Otis, American independence born here. You were saying one of the things you get to do under common law is you, you, you have the right to be free from unwarranted searches and seizures. Yes, and um, because uh, England said their soil was free. Mm -hmm. The soil of this island is free because it's common law country. But they refused to allow us to say our soil is free, that when a man's or a woman's foot touched it, regardless of his former condition of servitude, all chains and shackles fell off. That's mm -hmm. been the law of England since the very beginning. And we said, no, that's the way it is here, too. Your land is not different than ours. Our land is God's land, and he's the elodial landlord, and therefore, this is the free soil doctrine of common law applies here. Well, of course, there was an inconsistency going on here, which mentioned, we mentioned a while ago. But at the same time, the other common law rights, we begin to say, wait a minute, uh, the people on the other side of the world in India and Pakistan may not know the difference, mm -hmm. but we're British. We have consanguinity, as Jefferson says, our Declaration of 76. Therefore, you aren't going to fool us into this. We know that we're entitled to these rights. Our charters of our separate colonies even guarantee that. We're a common law people. Admiralty law does not apply to people on land. That's what they were saying. It even got so bad, uh, forget one of the New England colonies, they had admiralty law courts, that's all they had, which mm -hmm. didn't, do, don't use the jury. I remember this, yes. And they even impaneled juries in their admiralty courts because they weren't going to submit to not using the jury. But that was the idea of it. So, if there's admiralty law, there is no freedom from unlawful searches and seizures. I mm -hmm. used to be a sailor. When you're at sea on a ship, and the master at arms wants to search through your belongings, he just busts the lock or tells you to open or, I mean, you, there's no question. You hope uh, he asks you to open, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> he can bust it if you And I saw that happen to people. Mm -hmm. um, there is no, uh, it's, it's um, the law of the city in the sense that it's martial. And the captain, the skipper, the old man, he has absolute power of judgment. Mm -hmm. He does hear evidence at captain's mast, but his word is final. Well. That's what they were trying to do. They were extending admiralty law from the ships onto the piers, into the pier warehouses, then into the homes to the point, and it says this in our Constitution, and the Declaration of 76 mentions it, to the point that they were housing British soldiers in people's homes. Why? So the ears and the eyes of government were in the home. It brings the law of the city, the martial law, into the home. And, of course, then, then when they wanted to search for contraband that had been shipped without paying taxes, for example, all they needed was a piece of paper from, as James Otis put it in his argument, when he was arguing against this, some ignorant clerk Mm. Well, that meant in those days a clerk is a low-level bureaucrat. Yeah, just a guy yeah. walking around taking inventory. Yeah. yeah, signs a piece of paper, say, I can I, I look anywhere I want. Well, here's the piece of paper that says so. Well, who signed it? I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what they were doing. And so those were called writs of assistance. A writ is a command in writing from a greater to a lesser. He said, I'm greater, I'm the government. I am the swarms of bureaucrats, or how does it say it in our Declaration of mm -hmm. 76? Swarms, swarms of, of officers, officers yeah. in our Declaration of 76. I'm one of those guys, and I have authority to do anything I want. Uh, who's going to who, who's gonna call my hand? That's mm -hmm. the way it was working. People were getting hurt. Property was being destroyed, taken, seized, without a neutral and detached magistrate, as our Constitution puts it in the Fourth Amendment, without a piece of paper, Ev ev evidencing the, uh, the authority of the officer to search and seed, seize, particularly describing the place to be searched yes. and the things to be seized. In other words, you, in, in, under our... In other words, you've got to know what you're after and that they actually have it. Yeah. You don't just get to go in and search. And you know what you're after and yeah. you've got to prove to a neutral and detached magistrate called a judge with black robes. You've got to prove to him uh, by your affidavit that you have good evidence that whatever you're looking for is there. If you don't have that, even if you think it's there, that's not good enough. You're not going to get a warrant. There was a time in America in the not too distant past, and I remember this, you remember the time, I know kind of how old you are, mm -hmm. that that was not true. You had to have that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And there have been so many whittlings away, so many erodings of that right, that it, as a practical matter, 
doesn't really exist. This has been my experience yeah. in the courts, real hard experience. Uh, oh, I just hit my mic. That's all right. Don't worry about, <laughs> about that. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm great because this is basically how I outlined the, the interview and in that there's sections in the books on those very phrases, the whittling away of this over time. And yes. There was a great book that came out a few years ago by Radley Balco called The Rise of the Warrior Cop. And uh, it was bestseller, it was a really well done book and he basically outlines the whittling away through various court reasonings and and the, the rise of the use of SWAT teams to where they created these to raid for drugs and they would, they would the statistics on them in the 1970s, they, they would raid 15 or 20 a year in the U.S. and now it's like 100 a day. Yes. Uh, and, and they're used for everything. And they'll yes. just do no-knock raids and break down doors to go check for some small thing and then turn out they're in the wrong house or there was nothing there or whatever. And I'm thinking, how do we get this far? Yes. Uh, but one of the things that stood out by, about Radley's book was but he begins it with a discussion of the Third Amendment, which was about the quartering of troops. And which is applicable. Uh, and it's the exact same issue. Yes. So yes. we've basically, instead of, you know, we, we get sentimental about the revolution. We think well, we, we would be one of these people that kicked out the redcoats and fought for freedom yes. and all this stuff. But we've got a standing army of police forces across the country by the hundreds of thousands, millions of uniformed police officers that constitute legally a standing army that has basically the same rights by statute and by court Yes. Uh, to, to search you under various conditions or sometimes with no evidence or warrant at all. Yes. And it is an exact parallel and it's an exact historical development of the same, same system of law. And uh, I think that's interesting. That's something readers or listeners need to understand too. This is not just a random other topic you were talking about. This flows organically out of our loss of our common law system, biblical law system. And not seeing the clear distinction. And the rise of this. Yes, not seeing the clear distinction between the law of the land and the law of the city. There is nothing else. And that distinction needs to be stressed. And it's simple. I know people, Joel, that teach, for example, and good men that have taught all their lives, for example, there are seven kinds of government. Well, there may be seven ways to categorize government, but let's start with the fundamental and say, no, there are only two. Mm -hmm. And once you've got that, then you can distinguish the different labels of the law of the city. But mm -hmm. there is only two possibilities. Abe Lincoln said, uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates at the fairgrounds in Charleston, Illinois. He made the comment, that there are only two possible political positions you can take. For whatever else that people may think about Abe Lincoln, he did say some things that were true. He said there's only two positions that can be taken, and he said you're either tending toward the one or you're tending toward the other. Mm -hmm. It's either the law of the land or the law of the city, but he put it this way in more graphic terms. He said there's only two positions. It's uh, either you work, you earn bread, and you eat it. Or it's you work, you earn bread, and the other fellow gets to eat it. That's right. And he, then, he, then he said that comes down to the divine right of kings, which is the fundamental doctrine of the law of the city, which says the government does no wrong and cannot be questioned on earth. Mm -hmm. That was the doctrine of King James I. That was the doctrine of Henry VIII and many other tyrants throughout the world. And then there is the doctrine that says, no, uh, all power among men, all authority is derived from men his maker. Him. He has given us a law. It's pretty particular. The greatest law book ever written, more than one justice has said in our common law world, is the Bible. It is a book about the way things are. I like to put it this way. It is a book about the way things are and they're not going to change. I call that law. People say, well, uh, is the gospel law? Well, yeah, there's a law of faith, the Bible says. And the gospel is the way things are. Call it mm -hmm. what you want. Don't, you don't have to use the word law. It's the way things are, yeah. and they're not going to change. It's not the theological distinction that would throw people off, but it is a law. It's, a, it's God's law. Yes. All of his word is. In that sense. So, this, is, this is even more important to me because it's not just about police. You know, you're talking historically, we talk about the red coats or the officers, swarms of officers. Yes. Today, the swarms of officers include the police departments, even the sheriff's departments, but yeah. it also includes all the executive agencies that are now armed. Even the ones that aren't armed still have the same legal power, such as child protective services, divorce courts, a whole range of all these agencies, not to mention all the federal bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. 
so this is a system of law that, going back to what you said at the very beginning of this discussion, what, what, where's, what would some, be something that distinguishes the two systems, whereas there's due process in one, what's in the other one? You said torture. Yeah. yeah. And, well, if you go back to something <laughs> like the Inquisition, yeah. you can see a direct lineal descent in history of the two legal systems to what we have today. That's where you can be, have your children yeah. taken away, yes. you can have your bank accounts garnished by the IRS with Without any very due little process. right of yeah, no due process, very little right of appeal. You got to jump through all kinds of hurdles. The other one that's very popular today is uh, civil asset forfeiture. Uh, no due process, a taking without just compensation. It's the same stuff, and the police departments are the same way in many regards. In fact, most regards, I would say. No, it's the mindset now that's happening, and it happened yeah. in our own country. The shift to administrative law, that other. Exactly. Label for the law of the city, yeah. regulatory law, during the days of um, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and there was a switch in time that saved nine on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And remember amazingly, that. you remember, it, I think it was Justice Jackson, the one we were talking about a while ago. Mm -hmm. He said a lot of good things, but I, we can double check that. But yeah. there was a switch in time, and then instead of there being a presumption against the constitutionality or the lawfulness of bureaucratic regulations, the court said no, the presumption is now that they are constitutional and the burden's on you to prove they aren't. Mm -hmm. And that now is the law of our courts. I should say, I should be careful and say that's not law because it's, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's the position they take and call it law. And we fall for it, we accept it, we, we, we let it happen to we us. We have let it happen. Who's responsible? We are, that's true. My parents too, my grandparents, my great grandparents. But I will say this about them. Back when my, these things happened and my grandparents were um, the ones that were the ones that could have stopped it politically, I suppose, they didn't have the information we have today and they didn't have the internet and what they did get was pretty controlled. Mm -hmm. I'll say that in their defense. Mm -hmm. And sure. they were working pretty sure. hard. Much I don't harder to find books like these at yeah. that time, wasn't it? <laughs> well, that and yeah, books. because you'd have, well, you can go to the internet now yeah. and get them. That's and, right. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up and move on to another one here in a minute. But Don't Talk to the Police by Brent Allen Winters. This looks like a little slim, and I know you designed it to yeah. put in a suit coat and all that. Uh, but this is 90 pages, and it's, it's fairly fine print. Yeah. A lot of references in here to court cases. Uh, justice uh, of uh, Supreme Court justices and a lot of other biblical references and all kinds of ton of information in this little slim book. So it's not it's not something you just sit down and read and toss. This is, there, there's a lot of thinking that goes on here. And, it, and it, yeah, well, I appreciate you yeah. saying that because that's a, an objective opinion for yeah. me to say it. It wouldn't be the same, <laughs> but it arose out of uh, hardship. Okay. And and real experience in the courts. Absolutely. So uh, I recommend this book for all the readers. Uh, and we carried it at American Vision too, and we'll talk about a couple more in a few moments. Thanks, okay. Brent. Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Brent Allen Winters uh, discussing his little booklet, Don't Talk to the Police. Now, don't let the size and shape of this fool you. This is a, a almost 90 page, in fact, it is 90 pages uh, booklet and uh, packed with information from the Bible, from American history, and from the history of our common law traditions, which is our tradition of freedom. Our, our systems of free speech, the right to remain silent, the right to be uh, free from unwarranted searches and seizures and all of that, uh, all of the things that we hold dear in our Bill of Rights, in our American history traditions, all of that discussed here in a way you've probably never heard before, and if you have, in a very powerful and succinct way that's tied to the doctrines and history of Christianity. So I suggest, please, uh, I would recommend that you go to our store at AmericanVision.org. Check out our store where you can find this and Brent Allen uh, Winter's other books, including his uh, magnum opus, The Excellence of the Common Law, which I also highly recommend as required reading for Christians today. So please check those out and look forward to our further interviews to come.